Uh, this week on Three Sides of the Coin, uh, we are joined by Larry Mazur, who uh, Kiss Manager Extraordinaire, who shares a ton of cool stories about Eric Carr and revenge. And also, you have me on here too. So right there, that's just worth watching. Well, did you say really it? say nothing mm-hmm. until the last thirty I, I, I seconds? Agree. No, because I was listening. It's all about listening. You've got to listen. It's amazing. Oh yeah. I have no, I was just. I was. Listen. Got to listen to this one. Yeah, it's a listening. It's a good listening and a learning one. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So stick around. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. This week, Three Sides of the Coin, you got all of us. All four of us. Mark, I don't know how we do this with these two two gate crashers showing up every once in a while whenever they want to. It's like they just come and go. Hey, oh, look, I was working at my desk and the freaking thing rang and I answered it. And here I am. (laughs) What do you want, man? I don't know. Anyway, let's, you know, we know there's not going to be, we know there's not going to be any comments read anymore because Tommy's given up that job. No, that's not true because I have some. You just don't act. You just act like I wouldn't, and that's just okay. Give us not. a comment or two, real well, quick. Well, yeah, because I was on the show, so why wouldn't I read comments? <laughs> <laughs> I was on. Oh, the show. Come on. Um, you know, we have we've got a lot of positive comments, and this is the one that we are our latest, which is the Rock Candy Magazine issue, where they have the round table discussion. But we're we're also taping a little early, so I don't have as many at this point. Uh, but Patty wants to know: Doesn't the Hollywood Casino in Tindley Park hold about twenty six to twenty eight thousand? Uh, I believe the grass section is the largest in the country. I always thought Alpine Valley did. I could be wrong, but I thought that uh, Detroit was even bigger than that. You know, I've been to, obviously I've been to both multiple times. I think, I think Tinley Park's a little bigger. I don't, I don't. Our, our, hill, our hill is a little bit more, meaning at Pine Knob, it's, I think it's, I don't, I don't think it's as big as Tinley's. Another one too. Um, what's the one in, in Cleveland? Blossom Heath. Oh, Blossom. Yeah. That's got a big hill too. That's got a really big hill. I think that I know that hill is bigger than the one in Pine Knob. Star Lake has a big hill. If you're talking about amphitheaters with yeah, yeah, yeah. severe with a, hills, it's Star Lake yeah. has it. Because when yeah. it rains, you slide all the way down the hill. And yeah. this was this comment is complete and total foreshadowing of the show today. This is DB Threshold. I ch- says Check out the Troubadour show from April 25th, 92. That would be a good off the soundboard album. Good representation of that lineup. Wow. Uh, We didn't plan uh, that at all, people. uh -uh. Uh -uh. No. But as Tommy says, it's a a good segue Uh into this week's guest who brings up that show specifically. We got Larry Mazur here for at least 90 minutes. I didn't keep track, but you know, he goes way into kind of a little bit of how we got into the kiss camp and then really spend some time talking revenge, the revenge tour, the revenge album, um, his conditions for managing kiss. It kind of goes everywhere. We do a little buck cherry talk. We do some Cinderella talk. We do some music industry talk, some grunge talk. I got to tell you, if you really dig minutia on Kiss history, you got to listen to this because that hot in the shade revenge era, so much history from Kiss. Such important eras for Kiss, transitioning for Kiss. So Larry, so full of stories, so many Uh great stories, such great insight. I I can't hear he talks Ooh. about Eric Carr. He talks about what happened with Eric Carr at the end. We didn't ask him. He brings it up all on his own because he wanted to clear the air. So you got to let this roll because you don't want to miss this. Want to get your official three sides of the coin logo and shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. 
A3 Sides of the Coin world, we are really honored to have returning, and I should have done my um, show prep. I can't even remember when you were last on, Larry. It was probably a good six, seven, eight years ago. I don't know. Yeah, it was a while. It was a while ago. I don't think Mark I think it was, was even, pre-me, yeah. It was pre-Mark joining the show here, but we're we're so happy to have Larry Mazer join us. Um, and and for those of you who paid attention to the show just prior to this one, which was the Rock Candy Roundtable, Larry sat in on that and uh, dropped some kernels that had Mark and I just like all giddy as KISS fans. <laughs> real, real quick, Larry, you don't know this, but after the show, Mike and I were talking uh, after we recorded uh, the show with you at the round table. I'm like, Hey, you got to get that guy on. I could sit and listen to him talk about kiss for fucking days. <laughs> so that was, that was uh, really cool. Your, so, uh, your participation was incredible. That so was cool. um, Larry, you went, so you were brought in, as you mentioned in the rock candy round table, you were brought in, in the hot in the shade era but after hot in the shade was recorded so you were basically there for the tour and then you were there for revenge um this episode i really want to focus on the revenge era that you were there for but give us just a little bit of background how did you end up working with kiss so kiss was prior to you were they was that self-managed or was that when jess hilson was managing well okay so after Bill of Coin, uh, they went with their business managers, Glickman and Marks, yep. for a number of years until there was some financial funky business there. And then they hired Danny Goldberg, uh, who at that point did not yet have Gold Mountain management, who was just had Gold Mountain records and a few other things. They hired him, they had known him from the past, and they hired him as, quote, a consultant for a year or two. I think he did the um, Animalize. uh, And I think he, I don't know if he, I think he was there for Smashes, Thrashes. I don't think he was there for um, Crazy Nights. But anyway, he was prior to me. And what happened was, is that I was managing Cinderella, who was also on Mercury Records. uh, And the first record had done 3 million. The second record had come out in August of 88 and had already been platinum on its way again to another 3 million. And in October of 89, I got a call together from Gene and Paul saying that uh, they were looking for somebody to get involved with their new project, Hot in the Shade. Would I be interested? At that point, they were working mainly out of New York. They had a thing called the Kiss Company on uh, Fifth Avenue. Um, And I said, yeah, I can come up tomorrow and let's talk about it. So I took a train up from Philly where I live and... um, at that meeting was Gene Paul and this guy named Jess Hilson, who they introduced as the guy, sort of like the general manager of the Kiss Company. And I later to found out that he was Paul's psychiatrist. So those were the three guys at the meeting. And uh, as I said in, uh, in my interview in Rock Candy, that basically, you know, they asked for my point of view and I was very adamant about certain things. The most thing being that I had felt that since the makeup had come off and Gene had developed other interests, such as acting in horrible movies and uh, starting his own label, Simmons Records, and managing Liza Minnelli, that Kiss had become Paul Stanley's band. Uh, they had not had any singles released in the non-makeup years that Paul didn't sing lead on. And that I always felt as a longtime fan who had been a fan since the very first record in 1974, Uh, that what made Kiss special was the positioning of the two of them as co-lead singers. So I said, the first thing we have to do is you have to get back into Kiss. Uh, You have to get rid of Simmons Records. You got to stop managing Liza Minnelli. And uh, if you're willing to make those leaps, I'm I'm totally involved to get involved. And uh, they gave me a copy of the record, which I got to admit, I was disappointed in. I thought... uh, It was very average for the most part, except for three tracks, uh, Rise to It, Forever, and Hide Your Heart. They had already done, Hide Your Heart had already gone out to radio, um, and then they had already done the video for Hide Your Heart, and I was stunned to learn that for some weird reason, there were four other cover versions of the same. Exactly. Molly Molly Hatchet. 
Molly Hatchett, Ace Freely. Ace Freely, Robin Beck. Maybe it was only three, but Ace Freely, Molly Hatchett, and Robin Beck all released the same song at exactly the same time. Which I thought was so um, confusing. Huh? That was so confusing. Yeah, totally confusing. I don't know how that happened. So uh, it did. And uh, that's so why really, they needed a manager. Right. <laughs> so what had happened was I said, let's put a tour together. And it very, it felt very blase as far as response from promoters, because, you know, the, uh, the tours before that had not been totally successful. At one point they were down back playing 3000 seat theaters. Um, so we then came with uh, forever and luckily it became their first top 10 single since Beth. And uh, off of that, I was able to then, uh, put together a uh, extensive uh, American tour. Well, and that's let, basically how it started and how let, I got involved. Let me let me ask you, I, I really want to see if we can dig into that sort of the ultimatum that you gave, especially Gene, right. you know, to sit there and, and say, Gene, you've got to come back to the band. You've got to stop your label. You've got to stop managing. And I think you even mentioned in, in the Rock Candy and stop, stop sticking your tongue, your tongue out. out. Right. How was that received by Gene and how was that received by Paul? I think Paul was over. I mean, again, I think Paul was overjoyed by it. And uh, because I think he felt the same thing. And uh, and Gene, I mean, look, look, to answer the question easy, I got hired. So obviously, <laughs> obviously they supported what I was saying because they hired me on the spot. I mean, I literally that meeting happened at like 10 or 11 o'clock. And by noon, we were over at Mercury Records having meetings as the, as I was the manager. So Really? That obviously, quickly? Obviously, oh yeah, it was that. It was immediate. I was hired on the spot. So did you get? Did, they they bought into what I was saying. Did you get a feel from them? Because it seems a little odd to me that they're bringing in a new manager after the album had already been recorded. The first single was already out. It's sort of you. You feel like managers come in in these transitional periods between albums. Normally, yeah. Were were? Did you feel like they were kind of, for lack of a better term? in a desperate situation i didn't think to be honest with you man i didn't think about it i was just so excited they were one of my favorite bands i literally have been a fan since the first record um and you know i love the band so it was it was a thrill i mean it was a thrill and i just jumped in full two speed you know ahead unfortunately though as you know the gene thing didn't really take hold until revenge because at that point the image was still there for the cover for hot in the shade uh, the record was made, so there was no way to really change. And unfortunately, the three good songs that I felt out of 15 were all sung by Paul. So really, I wasn't really to fully augment my plan until to revenge. But uh, I think they got it. I mean, like I said, I got hired. So obviously they got it. So, uh, Well, uh, you know what I'm curious about is uh, from a, a fan's perspective. Yeah. When they took off the makeup and they went into all of that stuff in the mid 80s, I felt like they abandoned everything that they were to create something new. And I don't blame them for that. But the first step back for me to feel like of a full buy in was the Hot in the Shade tour. Right. Who was the one who slapped them across the head and told them they need to change the set list, start playing longer sets and incorporating older music? A lot of that was me. Because Thank that you. was one of the best tours non-makeup ever. That well, whole tour I, was I, I, I appreciate you saying that because uh, I really believe in my heart and I've done a lot of great tours over the years. But to my grave, I will say that is the greatest show I ever was involved with. I mean, as good as, good as the Cinderella Long Cold Winter Tour, which I think is another that was amazing, amazing, amazing stage show. But the Hot in the Shade Tour, every element of that tour was just magnificent for me i mean just top to bottom from the beginning right to the uh, i mean i mean one thing i will tell you and i think i told this in some interviews but one thing i was adamant about was not revealing the kiss sign which was the standard that was rule number one since 1974 was the centerpiece of the stage is the kiss sign and i said we've got this incredible sphinx let's use that as the centerpiece and if you remember the show, I mean, it really, the Kiss side did not come out to the, the last song of the set. The Sphinx exploded, came down. And then when they came back for the encore and started, I think it was, uh, I want you. I want you. I, I want you. I want yeah. you. Is that when it, you know, they start off, we had a disco mirror ball from the ceiling. 
So at the, the soft <laughs> beginning of the song, we had lights off of the mirror ball. And then when it went to the driving buildup part, up from the ground came the kiss sign with, and one thing in retrospect, I don't know if you noticed this on the tour, but for some reason, the lighting company put like the most high powered bulbs in the kiss sign to literally, it was blinding when it came up. And we used to have a funny thing at the sound console where I would watch the shows or whatever, is that our production manager, Charlie Hernandez, every day went out and bought a box of sunglasses and everybody that was on the soundboard vips whatever were all handed sunglasses before the encore and he wouldn't tell them why he just said you'll know when to put these on and sure enough when that sign came up the illumination was so powerful that literally it was like oh my god you got to wear sunglasses but that was one thing i was very proud of in that show is that we sort of trampled on tradition a bit by not having the kiss sign reveal itself to the very end of the night and i think it just was the coda on what was an incredible show. I agree. How, how important to the success of the Hot in the Shade tour were the support acts? I mean, you had you had Slaughter, you had Winger. Uh, you know, these, these were big bands during the late 80s. Well, I had given Winger their first tour. If you remember on the Long Cold Winter tour, the support acts were Winger and the Bullet Boys, who were both, I timed it perfectly, both acts went platinum on the Cinderella tour. And I got, I mean, I used to manage Rod Morgenstein and it was Steve Morris band back in the 80s. So he and I were very close friends. And they asked me to manage them when they were called Sahara, before they were called Winger. And they sent me a demo with a version of Purple Haze, which they ended up putting on their first record. But to me, I just listened to any band covering Jimi Hendrix. I said, nah. So I passed on managing them and then they became Winger and uh and I put them on the Cinderella tour because their first single um, 17 became a hit. So I put them on that. And then they, they carried on with a successful second record. So it was obvious to give them that tour. And then I had used Slaughter, I think on the Cinderella European tour. So again, they were just breaking. So I put them on. I mean, again, every time you put a package together, you try and find, I believe in one plus one plus one equals five in a perfect world. So you do try and find support acts that have some, that adds something to the show. Um, sometimes it doesn't matter, but sometimes, you know, it does. People like the idea of, a, you know, uh, like a theater, beginning, middle, and end. So I always try and put together as good a package as I can. Whether it sold tickets on that tour, I don't know. I mean, again, remember, we had a top 10 single, and that was, that was really the driver that I think drove most of the tickets was forever. So, so again, I, you know, I'm glad we put together a quality package, but I couldn't tell you today, I couldn't quantify and say, did it sell that many tickets? I don't and, know. And, and, and before we move on to Revenge, one final yeah. question. Sure. Uh, Hot in the Shade tour was Eric Carr's last tour yeah. with Kiss. Right. And, you know, it's, it's pretty much public knowledge now that at least on that last tour, there was tension between Eric Carr and especially Paul Stanley. Anything in, in that that you can discuss? Uh, I never really picked it up. Uh, I do know that, uh, again, I never really, I was surprised when I, over the years, I've heard of these stories. I never witnessed it. I mean, I will admit though, Eric and I weren't really close friends because I think unfortunately, I was asked to call and introduce myself when I became the manager. And the first thing I said was, I hate drum solos. So I think, unfortunately, <laughs> I don't think he endeared himself to me, although we got very friendly later on, but I don't think that really endeared him to me. But I do hate drum solos. So I, I was honest, which I am. I'm brutally honest. So I'm with you on um, that. I, uh, I, I never really picked that up that much. Uh, so over the years, when I heard third parties talking about it and things being written about it, I, again, I can't tell you I witnessed that. So I, I really can't say there was any tension. Um, and like I said, he and I slowly became friendly throughout the tour and later on. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I was in my mind, I was employed by Gene and Paul because they were technically Kiss. Uh, Bruce and I became very, very close to this day. I mean, uh, I spoke to him last night and uh, I met when he got let go with the makeup, I then managed the band he did with John Karabi called Union. So Bruce and I have stayed very close over the years. Whenever Grand Funk plays around this area, I go see them and uh, uh, and he and I have stayed, I'm very proud of the fact that he and I have stayed very close friends. Um, 
But again, I, I really felt that Gina Paul was who I was working for. So I really spent most of my time making sure they were happy. So, you know. So, so, so we, we move out of Hot in the Shade, huge, this, a very successful tour, a, yes. an album that had some, had a great hit in it, but was average to the fan, average to the fan response afterwards. Fans are pretty much, oh, okay. It wasn't, wasn't still a well was done gold. album. Still, and, was a gold, and, still was a gold record. Yeah, you know, and and I think as you mentioned in the Rock Candy, it was like, hey, they're they're Gene and Paul are trying to save money. It was basically, you know, a a self produced, out, self produced, you know, high quality demos, not the best studio, whatever. So now Revenge hits, right? And how do you now you've got a kind of a clean slate to work with? You know, right. you're going to put together this album and this tour. How did you approach that? Well, they had they had worked with they had worked with Bob Ezrin on the God Gave Rock and Roll to You song for the Bill and Ted soundtrack. So that relationship had already refermented itself, refermented itself. Uh, and then Paul, I went to Gene's house. He played me certain songs like on Holly and Domino and a couple other things. And I heard some of Paul's stuff. And it was obvious. And at that point, Gene had changed his image. Um, so it was obvious. Did, did, did Gene, did, real quick, did Gene change his image on his own? Or were yes, you? Yes, I had nothing to do with it. You, I, there was, I, there I, was no, nope, no, nope, you know, consultants that are brought nope, in, no nope, wardrobe nope, I people. Give him, I give him full credit for hopefully listening to what I was saying and realizing that he needed to be back in the band. And I think uh, he stepped it up big time in his songwriting and stepped it up image wise. and. Uh, I give him all the credit, totally all the credit for, I mean, I'd like to think I planted the seed, but I give him all the credit for becoming a partner again in KISS. Yeah, because that that was, you know, in my opinion, and many fans will agree, Revenge Era is where Gene looked the best Gene Simmons ever out of ever. makeup, ever. ever. He finally, yep. you know, we, we all know that when they took it off on Lick It Up, he was lost. He didn't, you know, he was thought he was the demon but he had no demon character and it wasn't until you know 92 that he finally figured out who he was out of makeup and when he did it was just perfection yes so so you're you're hearing some of the songs how did you convince gene and paul after doing an album on the cheap that now you're going to have to bring a producer in and we're going to have to spend well, think, more like money. Like I said, I think that, that, that sort of happened on its own. I mean, I think they, they realized that Bob Ezrin was a great A producer and uh, God gave rock and roll to you came out great. And I think they, uh, it was just, it just happened. I mean, it was no, there was really no discussion. It was Bob Ezrin's producing the record. And I so, said, absolutely. So I, I was just going to ask, there was no other producers that were nope. being discussed. Cause I know you had mentioned you, Eddie Kramer is one of your favorite producers. It was Bob Ezrin right from the get-go. Yeah, although we used Eddie on Kissel to, to, to record and mix Kiss Alive 3, but yes. Sure. Uh, but Bob Ezrin was this secret sauce. Absolutely the secret sauce. And and how, you know, let's, let's remember the last album Bob did with Kiss prior to Revenge. The Elder. Music from The Elder, which obviously was not anything that anybody in, in, in KISS might be very proud of. How, how did they overcome any reservations of which Bob Ezrin are we getting? I, I don't, because I think his track record for, for, spoke for itself. I mean, he had done The Wall. He had done other Pink Floyd records. I mean, I, I think, uh, again, I don't think there was any hesitation. I mean, Bob Ezrin's Bob Ezrin. I mean, look, The Wall, The, the Elder was, and I wasn't there. I mean, The Elder was obviously them trying to, you know, be one of these bands that do concept records and for whatever reason it didn't work so you know uh you know i still think world without heroes is one of the best songs of all time i mean i love that song but uh you know i uh i i think they they just accept the fact that he was the right guy i mean he like i said i mean horses for courses and i think he uh he was the perfect guy to do the revenge record and he did he did an now, incredible job with with revenge um obviously eric carr had passed away yeah. So, you know, Eric Singer's being brought into the picture. And I, I want to pause you for one second. I, I do have to say something which I've never said before, but I'm going to tell you guys. And that, 
you know, I've read over the last 20 some years, and some of it came from Eric Carr's family, but I read all these stories about how, you know, non, non-feeling Gene and Paul were about, about Eric and how, you know, they were cold hearted about firing him in place of Eric Singer. And listen, I was there, I was in the meetings and I can tell you it was a hard decision but the fact of the matter is he was not going to recover. He had cancer of the heart. I mean, it was, and it went to, I would think it went to his brain, but he, he was not going to, he was not going to survive. The band had to go on and, you know, and unfortunately the guys were in a position where they had to make a change. It was not cold hearted. It was not non-feeling. A lot of people have held grudges against them for many years. And I've read many, many interviews where they've gotten slammed and it boils my blood. And I've wanted to reply many, many times and I haven't. So I'm doing it with you guys that all the criticism of Gene and Paul about the handling of the change from Eric Card Singer is bullshit. They were totally respectful. They were crushed by his death. I went to the funeral with them. They were totally devastated by his death. They were, he was a brother to them. But unfortunately, he had a disease that he was not going to recover from. And the band had to keep moving forward. And that's the end of the story. I mean, well, anybody that says anything negative about them in regards to Eric Carr doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. So. Well, and, and let's face it, Larry, in, the, in the, the time we live in now, it's very easy for someone to just make shit up or make the assumption that something. I mean, every single time they do something, there's always somebody coming online saying oh they did that on purpose or they're trying to screw you out of this or that i i just think it's that's just human nature now you can't get away from it no you can't you can't it's terrible but i just had to set the record straight well, with you guys that and like i said it's just every time i read it i still to this day because you know they just put out a my, my old friend david Snowden is doing an eric carr movie now which they asked yeah. me to be in and i re- i said i wasn't going to and i told the story why because I said, I hated drum solos and I didn't think I was the right guy to be interviewed for an Eric Carr movie, but even David Snowden, I said the same thing. I said, David, I'm telling you right now, if anybody criticizes Gene and Paul for that switch over, it's bullshit because it killed them to have to do it, but they had no other choice. The guy was not going to live, unfortunately. Larry, you know, speaking for, for everybody here, I appreciate you stepping up and saying that because honestly, in, in the 10 years we've been doing this, that is probably the number one most requested question and topic fans ask us to talk about. They're like, yep. can you guys talk about Eric Carr's passing and how he was treated by Kiss? And our response is always, how can we talk about it? We were not there. We right. have no idea what happened. All you have right now is rumors and innuendos by everybody who was around it until people Gene and Paul, which unfortunately they could say the truth, but people will still refuse to believe them. But somebody like you who says, I was there and this is the truth, you know, thank you for for doing that, because this is something that needs to be said, but we're not the ones to say it. You know, we're just three fans. We were we weren't there. We don't know. I was there. So so back to where I was going. So Eric Carr passes. Right. Eric Singer's brought in. And one of the things that as a fan, I noticed right away, Eric Singer kept his blonde hair. Yes. That was, you know, to a lot of bands, that's not a big deal. To Kiss, that was like, oh my God, that's huge. He's not being asked to dye his hair. Of course, of course, it didn't stay blonde when he became part of the makeup band, but yes. (laughs) During that period of time, he stayed blonde. So, Eric so Singer, I, I love Eric Singer. I absolutely adore Eric Singer. Uh, I tried to manage Badlands and uh, Eric wanted me to. And unfortunately, Ray Gillen decided to go with Paul O'Neill. But I mean, I love Eric Singer. He's a hoot. Everything out of his mouth is hilarious. And uh, if you watch the Kiss Confidential <laughs> DVD that I did, uh, the scenes with him and Gene are just hilarious in there. So, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, he really... He really grounded them a lot because he, you know, he was able like me to be, you know, stop the bullshit, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, it was, it was, was, I loved the fact when he was in a band, I really enjoyed him being in there. So Uh, real quick, I'm going to add in um, Lisa, our last co-host who was going to be a little late here. So she'll just join us in conversation. 
Oh, you have a lot of and, people on this. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> we have, we have, we I call Lisa. Three, I thought it's three sides of the coin. It was yeah, three sides. sides Le Lisa, sides Lisa sides comes and goes to fill in. Sometimes it's only two of us. Lisa, we're already recording. I'm sorry. So, so Lisa, meet Larry. Larry, we have to start, Lisa. are we going to start again from the beginning? I forgot no, that. not <laughs> at all. Not at all. Lisa gets to lose out on all that juicy. What did I miss? Um, I missed good just, stuff, he, didn't I? Oh, yeah. Larry oh. just explained what happened with Eric Carr's passing. Oh, really? You're going to have to watch could, the show next week. I guess I'm going to have to right. watch the show. That's right. No, repeat, um, no repeats. So, so, Larry, real quick question. I mean, what was, was there a discussion of like, you know what? We don't need to make Eric dye his hair. Was that never a thought? I, I, mean, I, I never, I, I don't know any, there was never a conversation I was involved with about hair color. So, no. I mean, it's, it's little, you know. It's little minutia things like this that Kiss fans just geek out on because again, <laughs> that that was that was one of those things where I saw the first photo with Eric in the band and I'm like, my God, he's got blonde hair. That's just so you, different. I must tell you, it's that was 1992. This is 2022, so 30 years later. That's the first time it's ever been mentioned to me about a blonde <laughs> guy being in a band. So I, I it just. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you guys just you guys just scoop me on one because I've never, you're, ever, you're, 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 I've you're never ever heard that I've never ever heard that one about hey there's a blonde in the band I, so that's that's a good yep, one for me yep, so you're, I you're thank dealing you with, for that I thank you for scooping me on that one you're so. dealing with kiss geeks who you uh, know as kiss okay. fans we we pay attention especially when it came out we're like this is so different this is not the same um so um, well I had, I had something I wanted to before I forget Larry can you Think about going back in time with Revenge and the music climate at that time, because things had shifted. Sure. You started to see Nirvana and all these other bands come up. How, how much did that play into how you're going to move forward, helping them with the tour and the promotion and everything for Revenge when they're clearly on the outside looking in compared to the new stuff that's coming out? Well, look, I can't I can't deny I was concerned because remember, I had seen Cinderella going from sell, having two triple platinum records and then another platinum record with Heartbreak Station. And then Monday, they're, they're the big, one of the biggest bands in the business and Tuesday, their career's over. So, I mean, it was, I mean, this, I always tell people, especially in, in Tom Bojour's book, Nothing But A Good Time, in the interviews I did there, I, I and everybody who was in that, that period would, would say the same thing is that literally it wasn't like a slow Decline. It was literally Monday. You're playing arenas. Tuesday, you're playing the Whiskey a Go Go. So it's like, so it was, it was very concerning. But for whatever reason, I just felt that Kiss was bulletproof to that switch over to grunge. And what's funny is really what happened after I left, and what they then did to try and win over that audience with that. I won't say the adjective. We you can say Carnival, it. Say it. Carnival of Souls know. record. Yep, we all know. <laughs> Carnival of Souls record. Asterisk, asterisk, Carnival of Souls record. Um, and so, again, that was a big misstep as far as I'm concerned, but I wasn't there. But uh, so I, I just felt like, uh, again, coming off a of Hot in the Shade, which I felt was an average record that went gold, had a sub phenomenal tour top 10 single when i heard these 10 songs or whatever it was for on revenge i was convinced they were bulletproof i just felt like which we'll get into the song selection i guess in a minute but i just felt like oh you know we're, we're, they're not going to fall prey like cinderella motley Crue, poison whatever to the to the grunge thing i felt like all speed ahead you know so well and before you go there, Larry, one other question follow up is, is can you walk us through a little bit like I'm a huge Cinderella fan. Tom right. Keeper is still one of my favorites. Absolutely. I'll see him, I'll see him next week on the Monsters of Rock cruise. Per okay, great. And, and he he's special to me. I think Cinderella, the, their sound and their music, everything was different. It's not like so many of the other bands from that era. Right. So what happened? Why did did it stop on Tuesday? What what transpired that hit these bands that hard? Nirvana, to... Nirvana, literally Nirvana. Smells like Teen Spirit. Smells like Teen Spirit video is killed killed the world, killed the whole scene. Which I moment. still and which amazes thinking... me. It just amazes me because it's funny, and I'll tell you a quick funny story to put a code on it. But it, it's funny because I mean, 
I've got 10,000 records in my house. I mean, I get a box. I got the Jethro Toll record sent yesterday. I've got the new Alan Parsons live album coming next week. You know, the Scorpions record will come two weeks after that. And, and it, I, I sat there, I literally sat there and I'm going, how is it possible that yesterday 18,000 people love Cinderella and today everybody hates them? How is that even possible? I, I, to this day, 30 years later, I have no answer for that question. I don't know. But here's what's funny is that, okay, fast forward now, it's 2004, and I get asked to manage a band called Lamb of God, who, next to Metallica and Slayer, are probably the biggest metal band in the world. Yeah, yeah. And I was worried, like, you know, when I meet with them, are they going to, like, hey, you know, this guy's a hair band guy, blah, 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 we're, you know, we're metal, we're pure metal, whatever. I walked to the rehearsal to meet them, and all of a sudden they started playing Somebody Save Me by Cinderella. <laughs> And Mark Morton, the guitar player, goes, hey, man, my first concert was Cinderella at the, at the in Hampton Roads, Virginia, opening for David Lee Ross. So, you know, I love that band. You're, you're going to be our manager. So and it's amazing how many bands today have love for Cinderella and some of the other A bands. And listen, I do believe that. And I know this is a kiss thing, but I just want to get back. To no, 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 no. We want to hear this. Please. But, you know, I, I, you know, I believe, unfortunately, if I could do one thing over again, well, there's a couple of things I would do differently, but I, the main thing I would do over again would be change the album cover on night songs because unfortunately that cover pigeonhole them. Listen, they were never a hair band. They were a blues rock band. Amen. I mean, yes. you know, <laughs> as I said in my interview in rock candy, that's out this month to me, you know, everybody passed because they thought Tom's voice was not radio friendly. What appealed to me was at that point, Aerosmith had done Done With Mirrors, which was not successful. ACDC had done Fly on the Flick of the Switch, which wasn't successful. And here comes Cinderella right down the pike of ACDC and Aerosmith. It was a no brainer <laughs> to me why it happened. But I never, which is why if you look at Long Cold Winter, they weren't looking like that. Look at Heartbreak Station, they didn't look like that. And even then was still climbing, which was after the Nirvana thing. I didn't put any pictures in there because I was trying to avoid still a the great record though. Grunge thing. But but again, I never thought they were a hair band ever. And that's why, you know, Long Cold Winter to this day still is in the top 10 list of every of the top rock records of the 80s. It's always in the top 10. And I'm very proud of that record. And uh um so, you know, again, I, I just I, I'm bothered by the fact that they were pigeonholed like that. And again, I, unfortunately, that first album covers what put them in the same league with Poison and Motley Crue and Faster Pussycat, whatever. And if I could do it over again and turn back time, that's the one thing I would change is that. Album you, you know, you know, Larry, I've shared this story before, and, and I agree with you about Cinderella's music. They're, they're not a hair band, but. When the debut album came out, I had never heard of them. And I was in a record store and I saw the album cover and I bought it sight on scene because of the cover. I just okay. thought the cover looked mainly the purples. I love the, the beautiful colors that were in it. It wasn't so much what they look like. So I bought it sight on scene, fell in love with it, saw them open for David Lee Roth, thought it was just like mind blowing. Um, but I was, you know, that sort of leads into. Well, it's funny, what, just as, as a fun thing. So. Mark Weiss shot that album cover and to tie it all together. Mark Weiss did the Crazy Nights album cover for Kiss. So there you go. There's a little so, uh, six degrees of separation for you. So nice. back to what, you know, what happened that changed overnight for bands like Cinderella from right. Monday to a Tuesday. And is it, do you think maybe it was more of the visuals of all these bands and not so much the music? Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. I mean, look, you had Eddie Vedder come out with this whole anti-star rap and Chris Cornell and obviously Kurt Cobain. They were not into any image whatsoever, which is what I think is beginning that the end of the rock music era uh, in, in that will be gone forever, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it was revolt against that image thing. And but, you know, all I know is every one of those bands went platinum every one of those bands played arenas and how many rock bands since then have elevated to the level of platinum and selling out arenas not many so no but the, but but know. the thing that really kind of that i don't get is okay so if i like save me i'm just not going to stop liking the song because the nirvana song comes out so did they literally lose fans that are like us who are just like oh i'm done because yeah. they don't look yeah. cool anymore yeah yeah 
I, I don't think, know why. I think I it was a why. reaction against the scene is what yeah, I think it was. It just, was. Yeah, I think it was just a total reaction against the scene. I just think for whatever reason, this anti-star cred scene sort of, you know, made fun of that scene. I don't know. I mean, it boggles me to this day. I mean, I was, I mean, look, I mean, my bank account definitely dwindled because of it. So I, you know, it affected yeah. me in many ways. And uh, I was stunned. I was, I was absolutely stunned that it was over, like, like over, like overnight. I mean, literally the scene was from 86 to 91 and that was it. And that, that whole period ended in five years. It was a uh, Larry really sad. quick. I, I, I just want to go to modern day before we go back and talk about something we, we mentioned earlier, you know, you were talking about Buck Cherry. I have that same feeling with Buck Cherry. I don't know why they're not huge. I love every one oh, of their records. Oh God! Exactly. I I just don't get. Well, if you how, read that well, article, I do understand. if you read if you read the article, Rock Candy, I come right out and say that to me, and I'm biased a little because I'm the manager. I think Josh Chott is the only rock star in the music business, and I think that guy the, is the epitome of a rock star. Absolutely. And those, the songs star. are so freaking. And good. then what kill, Listen, what kills me is this record. This is my second record with them. Um, War Paint was the first, and now this one. This record, bar none, is the best record they've made of their career. I don't know if you guys Hellbound? have Hellbound record. It Hellbound? is song oh, for song, the it's... best record of their career. They co-wrote and produced with Marty Fredrickson, who had done Sorry and done The Black Butterfly, but he's a top songwriter. The record is beginning to end perfect, Yep. and we're sitting here today, and worldwide, it has sold 17,000 copies. Worldwide. Which is it. Breaks my it, heart. Blows, just... it blows my mind. I mean, we the album debuted at number one in the UK on the rock chart. We had a uh, the song. Hellbound went number number one on the charts in the UK at radio is in this video, but I sit here every day and I just don't understand. We're out there playing clubs and it's like, mm -hmm. why isn't this band playing arenas? How is it that this record is not, I mean, there was not going to be any more gold records and rock, but why haven't we sold a hundred thousand yeah. copies? And I don't get it. I am, again, these are the things that keep me up at night and I just don't understand what's happened. I mean, I, there's a lot of things I don't understand what's happening anymore, but I don't understand what's going wrong. Well, it doesn't have an outlet, unfortunately. I mean, let's face it, back in the in the glory days, if you want, all the local, all, all the major cities had great rock stations yeah. that supported. And unfortunately, Vinny at Octane, which is really the only real powerful rock station anymore, he doesn't like Buck Cherry, and uh, he won't give him the time of day. And to spend what you have to spend to get on active rock radio, which doesn't sell records, isn't worth the investment. So that's why I've done five great videos and we've done, we'll have done, by the time we end in Australia in December, this cycle, we'll have done 250 shows. Well, and No More Lies, I think No More Lies is the strongest song on the record. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it's great from beginning to end. And it's just, it breaks my heart. I mean, I think, I mean, he calls me nightly and says, what am I doing? I said, Josh, you did, you delivered, you delivered the record. And what's funny is every review has been positive. There have been no negative reviews. Even the guys I call the blabbermouth four. Uh, which if you go on Blabbermouth, which I go on, there's, I don't care what they say about it, they hate it. There's these four guys that live in their mother's basements that hate everything. <laughs> and even they said, this is the best Buck Cherry record ever. And it's like, but for some reason, I'm sitting there with literally 8,000 sold in the US, 17,000 sold, 18,000 sold worldwide, and it breaks my heart. Well, well I bought two. I, I had to buy the Japanese one with the bonus tunes too. There you so. go. <laughs> but it breaks like, my heart. It really, yeah. I mean, but the whole business right now breaks my heart. That's a whole other. That's a whole other discussion. We could do, we could do yeah, another, just, another show. You work with them, I just wanted to touch base. And, and, and Tommy uh, yeah. and I both on this show have, have preached to you know the people who watch our show. Go out and get that record. All not not just that record, but all their records. I mean, they're, Buck Cherry yeah, is not rock and roll. Yeah, anytime, so anytime they're yeah. near you, guy. I don't know where all you are based, but whenever they're near, you see a show, call me and I'll put you on the list. So, <laughs> I am so, so so Larry, Larry, before, said, before the kid, before the kids fans, go ahead, Tommy. Dude, I just want to say one last. I know. I just want to say one last thing. I actually know most of them, and I'm always sending photos to Stevie because I think he can't get enough pictures of himself so <laughs> well he posts pictures of himself every single day on Facebook, all so. day long that, are they getting are they coming from you is that where these pictures are yeah. coming from no they are coming from me because they always set me up and i go out and shoot the show oh, okay oh yeah absolutely and i just i 
I can't say enough good about these guys. And so for any of you that are listening, I know this is a kids podcast, go out and get hellbound, go out and see these guys. They played in a freaking barn last summer that you usually go to see county fairs where they judge cows they'll play anywhere and they are unbelievable well the one thing i'm excited about is that finally after begging 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 since i've been managing now five years we finally have got a great opportunity that in uh march to april we're doing the alice cooper tour yes. which oh, I'm very that's, excited about. that's big very very excited about that that finally there's a chance for another audience to see this guy and hopefully become fans and then hopefully that'll lead into something else i mean you know again I want to put them with, I want to get them as many opening slots as possible. We did a couple of shows with Aerosmith a few years ago that went great. And uh, again, I, I think this guy's the last rock star. I really do. And that's the last I'll say. Who Why won't? not put them out with like uh, Blacktop Mojo and uh, Black? Well, Blacktop Smoke. Mojo supporting where when you see the press release on February 16th with the 54321 video, you'll see 19 shows April 29th through May 20 with Blacktop Mojo direct support wonderful because that to me that and then the only one missing would be blackberry smoke put all three of those together it would be a hell of a tour maybe yeah. cheap trick i don't know okay right. so 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 now that we've lost all of our kiss listeners let's go back to kiss on well, the top. five of us are here, the five of us are here. <laughs> exactly. exactly. we don't care we don't care, care. We don't care. care. after 10 um, years so so back, back well, no, to you the know, also you can edit this you can edit out all the book cherry stuff uh, i know oh, we no. give them oh, everything no. we love it so back to the revenge album okay and one of the other things that we we need to ask you about and kind of dig into was the return, in some sense, of Vinnie Vincent. You know, well, how did how did that develop? OK, well, I, I'm going to be very short to the point because I really don't know. Listen, when bands and this has been my I don't like the recording studio. I find it boring. Uh, I, I don't really appreciate just listening to tracks and then listen to over. I mean, I've always believed that what I like to go is when they start mixing and I can hear the whole thing. I don't really enjoy it. So literally I went to the studio once and that was to talk about the cover art. So I only went to the studio one time. Uh, and also I had hired a publicist, um, Mitch Schneider. And that was when I, he, I was in LA and he came to meet the band. So I only went to the studio once. And when I walked in, sitting in a corner was this real, in the corner was this real nebbishy looking guy. I didn't know who it was. He was sitting there with a notebook like this in the corner. And it wasn't until later on, almost when I was leaving, when I said, oh, by the way, who is that guy? And somebody said, oh, that was Vinnie Vincent. And he already left by that point. But so I got to be honest with you. I, uh, unfortunately, that's one gap I can't fill in for you guys because I had nothing to do with it. I don't know anything about how, he got back in the writing process or whatever. And like I said, uh, pretty much I only saw him in a corner once and that was it. So unfortunately on that one, I'm not good for information. Now, after the fact, did that help in marketing and promoting the album no, at all? Did no, you take advantage of the fact that we Vinny was yeah, a songwriter? We, we didn't use it at all. To me, what was the marketing point was Gene Simmons. That was my whole focus was Gene Simmons being back in Kiss. So, so let's focus on that. So okay. Gene Simmons is back right. in KISS. Revenge right. is an album that really spotlights everything about Gene. Great right. songs, lead yep. vocal. Broken microphones. <laughs> he had this last week. It's a new microphone. Really? Yeah. Oh, Michael. You hear me? Yeah, yeah, no, we yeah. There we go. There we go. Um, this microphone just likes to mute itself for whatever right. reason. Um, so, and we must how, give how, credit. All, listen, we must also give credit to Bruce Kulick, who co-wrote a number of those oh, songs. Oh, oh, yes. oh, God, yes. Bruce really came to shine. Bruce, to me, <coughs> Bruce to me was a major, major factor in how good a lot of those songs turned out. So, how was Paul's reception? to revenge really putting gene in the front spotlight okay well it's done i've told this story many times so i heard the record and right away unholy just blew my mind and i said we're going with that first and i could sense it was never talked about but i could sense paul was not thrilled by it but i was adamant i was not there was no discussion as far as i was concerned that unholy was going to be first and we did it and we did an amazing video 
which totally, I mean, you want to have the demon come back? There it is in the unholy video, as far as I'm concerned. Yep. And everybody at Mercury was thrilled to death. They were, they were aggressive in working it. And uh, they saw what I saw, that this is what was needed. If we want to compete, with this whole new thing of grunge and the the birth of the early birth of heavy metal with metallic and whatever this is what we have to do to compete so it was full speed ahead and there was no discussion that's what we were doing end of story and that's what we did now fast forward and maybe i'm anticipating your next question but fast forward to it's time for single number two and i said okay we're going with domino because I want to just drive this train through the tunnel that it's got to be Domino. We've got to make a statement. Gene Simmons is back. And I was at home one night and the phone rang and Gene said, we can't. And I said, why? And he said, because Paul will be unhappy. And I said, so I managed Kiss. I was hired to break this band and break this record. He goes, you have to understand, I've got to, he's my partner. I've got to keep the peace. I've got to like make sure everybody's happy. We can't do it. And I fought some more, fought some more. But at the end of the day, he was, he was adamant that we couldn't do it. So we went with I Just Wanna as the follow-up single, which was okay. But the album ended up not going platinum. And I, to this day, and I've said it in books, and I even wrote Gene an email because uh, when they played Atlantic City, I wanted to go to the show. And unfortunately, because of COVID, they couldn't see anybody. But I wrote him a note and I said, I must tell you, 30 years later, I regret to this day that I gave in to you on not going with, with, with Domino Second, because I'm convinced if we had done that, that album would have absolutely been a platinum record. And, you know, we went, with, video video picked we went up with a third, we went with a third, but it wasn't the same the local well, as, as, as we know, ti there. timing is so important Everything. in the yep. success of music. Yeah. Timing is all. Um, yeah. Is that that dynamic that you just talked about where Gene said, I can't do this. I've got to keep Paul happy. Is that dynamic common in, in many bands or is that something unique that you encountered in Kiss? Well, in, in most of the bands I've managed has always been the dominant. I mean, Tom Kiefer, it was Tom Kiefer who wrote Cinderella. He wrote all the songs and it was his, I mean, even though it was an equal band, he drove the car and uh, uh, with Buck Cherry, it's Josh pretty much with, uh, with Breaking Benjamin, it was Ben Burley, with Stone Sire, it was Corey Taylor. I mean, with uh, Lamb of God was more of a band. Well, really the drummer in that band really uh, was the leader of the band, even though everybody couldn't stand him, including myself. Um, but uh, no, as far as my history, that was a unique situation of having two partners, really. two people of yeah. equal. And I guess, I guess the only, the only analogy would be other bands that had multiple lead singers, whether it be the Eagles, Doobie Brothers, Hall and Oates, Loggins and Messina, where they were really partners. But in, a, in most of my bands, there was one lead singer for the most part. So that guy sort of was like the leader of the band. I mean, this band had two, well, really, technically four i mean in the original version four lead singers in my version two lead singers but um but it was pretty much you know it was it was it was unique of everybody i've been involved with in that there were two partners well let's talk about that just for a second because they let eric carr sing on hot, hot in the bottom. shade yeah no 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 on hot in the shade that he sang right. the song Little C, yeah. was there was yes was there any you know, moving, you know, you talk about growing. Was there any chance of him? I mean, obviously he didn't sing on, but had he not gotten sick, do you, would you think, or do you just think Gene and Paul was, were like, no, nah, he's probably not. I mean, I think uh, if he had written a song that, or if they felt there was a song to fit his voice, maybe, but uh, I mean, they did put on that car jam, that instrumental thing, but um, uh, I don't, I, I, I think at that point, it was evenly divided, Gene and Paul, that that's what, what the record was going to be. And, and I was thrilled. I mean, it's everything. That record was everything I, I dreamed about when I started Imagine a Band in 89. And it took that one cycle, obviously, because I wasn't involved with Hot in the Shade. But they gave me everything I wanted. Everything I wanted was on that record. I mean, we got Hugh Syme, who had done, uh, you know, my, my, biggest, uh, uh, my biggest favorite album designers were hypnosis who did all the pink floyd records and whatever but hugh sign was really the american hypnosis he did all the rush covers and uh 
and he did revenge. And so everything about that record to me was immaculate from the cover to the live show to the, even though I don't think it was as good as the Hot in a Shade live show, but still a great live show and, uh, and the music. I mean, you know, again, it, it begins and ends with the music and it was perfect. I mean, it's a perfect record. Perfect. Let, Larry, Larry go, go ahead, Tommy. I was just going to ask, granted you came in for Hot in the Shade, but let's just do some supposing. Let's say you were there one record earlier. Are you familiar with the Crazy Nights record? Sure, sure. Okay. One of the things that's been argued on this show and by many fans is that Kiss was no longer the leader once they took up the, off the makeup. They were more the follower. And they were always following Bon Jovi or they were following whomever to try to kind of catch the wave. And so the argument was they they chose the um, producer, Ron Nevinson, right. uh, who had great success with Heart to do that record. I think the songs are good, from my opinion as a fan, but it's really thin sounding. Would you have allowed them to to go that way or you would would you have pushed for a heavier revenge type record even in 87 no i probably would have i like that record a lot on the song listen i love pop music I, so i you know i really don't have much criticism i think reason to live is a beautiful song and uh and i think crazy nights is a good song and to be honest with you i'm a huge fan of rob nevis he's from philadelphia originally he moved to england he worked with emerson palmer and led zepp or whatever i'm a big rise matter of fact when I was managing Nelson, we met with Ron Nevison about maybe doing their second record because I was such a big fan of his. Um, so, no, I think I, I don't think I would have stepped in on, uh, on 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 Crazy Nights and done any differently. I definitely would not have let Hot in the Shade be done the way it was done. That I can tell you. But but Crazy Nights, I would have been fine with that. I like that record a lot. As, as a manager, Larry, you know, if you were managing when Hot in the Shade was being recorded and you said, no, you can't do these songs, you got to spend more money, you got to do more writing, better studio. And Gene and Paul were adamant about saying no. As a manager, is there a point where you say, OK, I can't manage you anymore? I've got to leave if you're not going to listen to anything I say? Uh, yeah. Yeah. How tough yeah. is that with a young band? versus a band like kiss which has two dominant well, except, people. Yeah, except the fact you're going to lose a lot of money but uh listen i think i'm very uh i think i have a way to win over people so i i think if i had been the manager i don't think i would have had much i think i would have been able to get my way than say to them guys these are not great songs i mean you know again you know they they you know they sort of build it part of the problem was and again remember cds had come out around 86, 87. So, and one of the, the big selling points supposedly of CDs was you can now put 77, whereas before you were limited to 20 minutes aside on vinyl for yep. fidelity reasons, you can now put 77 minutes on a CD. So you saw all these bands, Def Leppard, Leopard. everybody was just filling up these CDs. And I'll never forget John Mellencamp put out the Dance Naked album and it had 29 minutes. And literally every review was, what a ripoff. Not that it wasn't 10 great songs, but it was only 29 minutes long. What a ripoff. Well, and even the hype stickers. If I remember correctly, if, and I think I do, and you guys being the geeks that you are, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, I think there was a sticker on Hot in the Shade that literally said 15, 15. new Kiss Clack. Yes. Kiss something. Yep. And right away it was like, you're just filling it, you're just taking advantage of that we can put 15 songs on a cd let's just put 15 songs on because it'll be 70 minutes of music rather than rather than being concerned with having 40 minutes of great music let's just fill up the Crap. cd and that's why you know i just left when that i never forget when that Mellencamp record came out and i remember telling people can you believe this this record is brilliant and the and the critics are what a ripoff 29 minutes it's like what's the world come to you know so so, I mean, that's the first thing I would, I mean, I would have definitely sat down and said, guys, these songs aren't great. You know, these songs aren't great. Let's get a great producer. But, you know, again, I wasn't there. So I, I there's in hindsight, you're asking me a question. That's, I would like to think that I had their respect to the point where they would have agreed with me, but I can't turn back the clock. So I don't know. But Larry, Larry, Larry after, after you had that call with Gene, where he said, no, we can't do Domino as a second right. single. Did right. that moving forward 
change how you approach things within KISS going, oh, okay, I probably can't push this because now we've got to be equal, we've got to be fair? Or did you still continue to push for what you thought was the best? Well, I got Domino to be the third single. I got Domino to be the third single. And then uh, at that point, the album was sort of sort of plateauing. And I said, you know what? We had a hit with Forever. There's this beautiful song called Every Time I Look at You. Let's go with that as the fourth single. And unfortunately, it, at that point, to be honest, it's I think over. Mercury didn't want to spend any more money. I mean, we did a beautiful video with Mark Resica. did all the Cinderella videos. Uh, and he did uh, Forever also. But I think at that point, uh, you know, it's even back then to get labels to go four singles deep was very hard. I mean, really, really hard. I mean, Cinderella, we sort of did four on Long Cold Winter. We did three on uh, we did three on Night Songs. We did three on Heartbreak Station. Um, so to get a label to go four deep, to spend the money at radio, whatever. And I think they looked at their P&L and they said, you know what, we've already made X amount of profit. The record's sort of plateauing to go spend more money and really go after top 40. I just felt, and it's a shame because it's a beautiful song. And I think it's, I think it's as good as forever in a way. And I think it should have been worked harder at top 40 radio, but it wasn't. And at that point, that was the end. So it was two Gene and two Paul, you know. So let's, let's move to the revenge tour now. So okay. the, the tour, if, if I recall, because again, years ago came, the, the tour was the full arena tour didn't start for months after the album was released. They did a short club run. Is that correct? One of my, another one of my brilliant ideas. So talk to us about that. Well, I always try and do events. So what happened was to set up, to set up, there's two things, well, to, it's going backwards, forwards to go backwards. So like, for example, when we put out the, the, uh, Kiss Confidential DVD. Well, at that point, video cassette. There was no DVD. You know, I had them do signing parties all around the country. So we went into like the amphitheater in Dallas, Texas, and had them sit at a table and lines down the block to get their autograph. To, and then we did the Ritz in New York or whatever. So anyway, so to launch Revenge, I always try and do events. I mean, if you if you remember, I don't know if you know Heartbreak Station with Cinderella. I did a a party in New Orleans which cost a quarter of a million dollars, which I'm, people still talk about to this day is the greatest launch party ever that a record company put on for bands. Um, so I always try and do things that are cool and event oriented. So I said to them, all right, we got this great record. I want to do something cool. Let's do, I want to do a club tour. They said, okay. So I did from San Francisco through to, oh, because what happened was we had a European tour booked for technically the Hot in the Shade tour, even though it was, before Revenge in that gap, but we had not done the Hot in the Shade tour in Europe. So that's what the club tour led to them getting to New York to then go to do the Europe tour, which was technically the European Hot in the Shade tour, even though we were starting a revenge cycle. So we did a club tour and we did two nights at the Troubadour. The line was like a mile long down Santa Monica Boulevard. And uh, it was great. And it's funny, I just saw on YouTube, I don't know if you guys have seen it, being the geeks you are, you probably have, but if you go on YouTube, you could see the entire Troubadour show on YouTube. And I just discovered it one night about a month ago over Christmas holidays. And I watched it. And if you haven't seen it, you got to watch it. If you want to see one of the greatest Kiss pure rock and roll shows, watch the, the, DVD, the, the YouTube of Kiss at the Troubadour. Because no nothing, them on the Troubadour stage just being a rock band. And it is my mouth was on the floor of how amazing they are. And it showed me that you, that even though the show is a big part of kiss, they didn't, at the end of the day, they are so good. They didn't even need a show to go out and pull it off and watch that, that, that on YouTube, it'll blow your mind. But anyway, so we did the club tour and again, they said yes. And I thought it was incredible. I mean, it was like, I mean, here in Philadelphia, they played a club called the Troc. And literally, you could not breathe. I mean, I was gasping for air. They packed people in so tight that it was incredible. And so, yeah, that was how we launched. The, that was the promotional setup for the Revenge Tour. Revenge Record and Tour was the uh, the club tour. So then, then, then the arena tour starts. And, right. um, you know, you, you mentioned earlier that you thought Hot in the Shade might have been a little better stage production than Revenge. Either way, I think Hot in the Shade and Revenge are kind of bookends. They are both 
you know, themed stages. There's, you know, that's one of the things I always felt as a Kiss fan, especially during the 80s. It's like these stages, there's really no theme. It's just them up there. It's a big logo, lots of lights and lots of pyro. Kiss as a band seems ideal to have a stage. It's got some sort of a theme to it. You know, the Creatures of the Night had a tank stage. The right. Pure Destroyer Tour actually had little themes. Revenge, I thought, was amazing. You know, it was, you know, Escape from New York sort of look and feel. A, a, well, we had, it, we had the, if you go, and as a matter of fact, if you go in the, if you get the history book, there's a section there where Gene put in the, all the rejected designs for different stages. You know, the hardest thing is, again, like I said, with the Hot in the Shade tour is that the Kiss show starts in the middle and you work your way out, so to speak. And it was, it was so easy on Hot in the Shade because you had the Sphinx. So it was very easy to have that be the, the centerpiece. We had meeting after meeting after meeting with Robert Roth, who was the designer who used Hot in the Shade, and we brought him back for revenge of what can we come up with? And I just couldn't, I literally couldn't think of anything. And I couldn't tell you to this day who came up with the Statue of Liberty idea I really don't remember, but I mean, we just sat there in my office for hours trying to think of this and he put Robert Roth brought in design after design after design. No, that stinks, that stinks, that stinks. And again, the theme was always going to be like this urban decay thing, but we could never come up. And like I said, to this day, I don't remember who came up with these, the Statue of Liberty, which then turned into the Terminator afterwards. I guess, I guess my concern, why I think the Hot in the Shade Tour is better, was there was production concerns after the fact, after it was made, of there were certain buildings that it was too high, that we sort of hit the ceiling. There were a couple shows where the explosives didn't work right, and the, the transition from the Statue of Liberty to the Terminator <laughs> didn't happen the way they were supposed to, and certain pieces didn't fall off, that was whatever. So again, I, I don't know, it just... I got to be honest with you. I didn't enjoy the tour as much as I enjoyed the Hot in the Shade tour, just as far as the spectacle of it. Musically, I loved it. The set was great. Opening with Creatures in the Night was great. And I thought the set list again was perfect. But uh, I don't know. Just looking back on it, I didn't have as much fun on that tour as I did on Hot in the Shade as far as just the nightly spectacle of just that whole show. And I, I don't know. It just... Uh, I, it was I a little darker. I'm glad too. you guys like it. Was a, it yeah, oh, me, it was much. It was a much darker stage. For me, it was but just, it, yeah, for me, it was just one step behind the Hot in the Shade show. Hot in you know, the Shade was amazing. It really yeah. was. Yeah, and for so, us, it was at least for me, it was the set list like we were talking about earlier. It was just to see him finally play. I stole your love, and all. And it, the other thing too that that we've lost is the magic of surprise because none of us knew when we showed up at that show what we were going to expect. Now you can't get away from it. it and of course of course i'm sure you all enjoy these strippers during take it off well I, you know i was going to ask you about that so you know what 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 drove that decision of you know what let's get strippers on stage i mean all of a sudden kiss is trying to be a much tougher dirtier band i'm bringing strippers on stage all of a sudden well, we, the, we did the tech rehearsals at Stabler Arena in Allentown, which is about an hour from where I am right now. And, uh, and the first night, so we did tech rehearsals and we brought in, for the last night, we brought in an audience because uh, Stabler Arena is on the Lehigh University campus in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So we opened up to students, whoever wanted to come, small audience. And Paul, I think, had this idea of a stripper. And it turned out that the production manager of the show, his girlfriend was a stripper. And he said, hey, do you think you're, you know, we were talking about having for take it off about this, having this strip or whatever. And his, the production manager said, well, for the arena said, well, my girlfriend's a stripper, I'll have her do it. So she came, she never heard the song. She just went on at the, when they pointed to her, she went on and danced. And then it became this thing of, all right, so every day uh, the production manager, and for some reason I'm drawing a blank, on his name and it's killing me because he now does Ari for the last 10 years he's done Ario Speedwagon and for the life of me I'm drawing a blank on his name but every day he would have to call strip joints in that town have them send over 20 or whatever strippers and Gene and Paul would go in the dress room and sort of pick okay you four would be you know it was a contest of what four would become the strippers of that night 
And if you remember, when we put out the, the home video of Kiss Confidential, we actually released a clip of Take It Off that we put out as a standalone video, along with I Love It Loud, uh, of, uh, you know, as sort of like the single from that home video that showed all the strippers over the whole, t we filmed the entire tour of the strippers stripping. So, you know. That's awesome. So, so the, the the revenge tour gets underway, right. and you've got an incredible album, incredible look and feel. Everything feels like it's going perfect, and then the shows are not nearly as full as they were on the Hot in the Shade tour. Obviously, you know, because you know it's funny. I don't. Rem I gotta be honest with you. I, I've seen stories over the years, and look, I pride myself on my great memory, which I think you guys know, but. Uh, for some reason, I've seen comments over the years about half houses or whatever. I got to be honest, I don't remember that. I don't remember half houses. I remember the shows I went to were packed. I mean, so I, you know, I don't. Uh, I, I can say that I, I was I was living in Chicago at the time. So I saw them at the UIC Pavilion okay. in Chicago. And it was the top tier was completely I'll believe you. I'm just saying Locked I've off. seen that over the years talking about how poorly that tour did. I don't remember. I really don't remember. To me, I so, thought was was I guess where I was going with this, was there any discussions going on with Gene and Paul of like, hey, you know, uh ticket sales aren't as strong as they were on the Hot in the Shade tour. We've got grunge that's kicking our ass right now. Um, you know, was there some some worries were there any worries that I were don't being brought up during the tour i mean so as to make an analogy going back again in time the the cinderella heartbreak station tour we spent a million dollars building this ginormous stage i mean just ginormous it took seven trucks whatever and uh we literally went out on the road i had nelson and warrant uh, nelson lynch mob is the support acts on that because at that point, all those bands were dead. So I just chose my client who had a platinum record and George Lynch, who I felt still looked, was looked upon as a guitar hero. And I'll never forget, we went to Madison, the show bombed. It was the first day of the tour, it bombed. And literally that night we sent home the stage and all the trucks and just basically used promote arena stage at that point and swallowed a million dollar stage because it just was obvious that grunge was there and uh the ticket counts were like whereas long cold winter was playing to arenas sold out we were doing not even half houses and we had to eat it so jump forward uh there was no discussion about cutting the show cutting anything i just think uh we just excuse me we just plowed through i really don't i don't really don't remember any uh any discussion of cutting things back and like i said i don't remember any bomb shows i mean again maybe i'm in amnesia or something but i don't remember any because the shows i went to i remember the the weekend we shot the kiss alive three we recorded kiss alive three and shot the home video which became kiss confidential uh that was detroit cleveland and indianapolis the, oh, indianapolis and those were all packed so i mean again and the show in philly the spectrum i think was packed so i really don't remember bomb show i, I but, knew the show there's, the been, shows a lot of, out there's west. been a lot of stories about it so i guess i'm wrong so the shows out west were the ones that really maybe were i didn't go to any of those i didn't go there well, i was gonna say i was at the detroit I'm from, from detroit i was at the detroit show that was uh and it was crowded know, right that, oh hell yeah palace yeah. was packed it was great that was just a fun night all the way around it was, that whole weekend was great we had a great that was a great week eddie kramer came out mark resica filmed that it. it was that was a fun weekend that was really a fun fun weekend but and the palace I, uh, palace was nice for that sort yeah, of thing so again i don't uh i really don't remember but you guys know more than me when it comes to that topic i don't remember i mean i mean the, the tour ended up showed a decent profit so i don't i don't remember you know anything that didn't do well but Nobody, no, we didn't give money back to any promoters, so I don't think anybody got killed. So I don't know, but you, you again, I've how, read stories over the years, so obviously I have amnesia about some of it. So how about the the selection of the support acts on that tour? I remember, you know, thinking, okay, you got Trickster. I saw Trickster and Faster Pussycat, yeah, I think, yeah. and I was like, okay, I like these bands, but. In 92, Who was I gonna I'm like, 
Who was I going to you know, choose from? Yeah, well, and my question would have been, was there any attempt or thoughts of, well, could we get this new band Pantera to open? They Anything were, along a heavier none, band? None of those bands were interested. None of them. Was it because of what Kiss represented? They didn't want to be know. associated? I because, that, I mean, as I we know, our all agent, those I bands... Remember our agent, Mike Perini, just said, we do, this is our selection. This is it. So that was it. Because all those bands, even going back to grunge and Nirvana, nowadays in hindsight they're all coming out oh god i grew up i was a huge kiss fan you know we loved kiss you know nirvana covered a kiss tune well, we all know it, how much pantera I mean, I mean, were kiss fans uh, again jumping ahead a cycle which is where i ended my career with kiss and i've told the story many times and i might even have told you guys the last time is that you know the whole kiss my ass thing came out of me being in a record store and seeing a uh, an album called hard to believe which was all the Seattle bands covering Kiss tunes that I showed Gene. And then, of course, the eyes started spinning, the brain started spinning, the pocketbook started spinning, and that led to what <laughs> ended up being my end of the band, my relation with the band. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, all those bands named Kiss as their you know favorite band. But, a, again, it just, if I remember correctly, it wasn't an option. So it was what it was, and it was horrible both those bands stink and, you know, so, you know, I was not thrilled about it. And maybe that's also what added to my non in overall enjoyment of that tour versus the hot in the shade tours that the support bands were terrible. Yeah. I, I felt like hot in the shade, you had a perfect trio of bands. Yeah. And, you know, I think I went to two or three of those shows and I, over those, I saw slaughter winger and little Caesar. And I'm like, it's all perfect matches. Um, well, I will, tell, time... I, will, I will tell you a funny story. I'll tell you, uh, uh, and we got to get moving because I got to get out here soon. But uh, so I had heard, because I had Nelson at Geffen Records, I had heard this, the Little Caesar record. And it's funny because they're on this cruise next week and I haven't seen Ron Young, the singer, since then. And I'm looking Ron, forward to seeing him too. No, Ron's a great guy. Incredible singer. And I'm looking forward to seeing him to sort of recant some of what I'm about to tell you because I don't know if he even knows. So I'll never forget this. So I and listen, Gene and Paul let me put on who I want to put on. I, I chose the support acts on both tours and they let me again have carte blanche. I mean, that's one thing I've said in every interview. Those guys never said no to what other than the unholy thing or the domino thing. But as far as opening acts, set list suggestions, whatever, never said no to me, which is why I say it's the most fun I ever had magic band in 50 years of management is Kiss. But so they let me have carte blanche. So I heard the Little Caesar record. It blew me away. I thought this guy's voice was incredible. They had a hit with Chain of Fools. It's, it was great. So I put them on the tour. Anyway, so I was managing an English band at the time called Thunder, who also were on Cap were in Capital, and then they got dropped. And I got them signed to Geffen, but they were on Capital. And they flew over to do their, quote, record company showcase at the Roxy in L.A. And... Uh, so the band's on stage playing. All of a sudden, I get a tap on my shoulder, and it's a girl from the Roxy saying, you have to come to the production office. There's an emergency call for you from Gene Simmons. I said, what the fuck, Gene Simmons? How do you know I was here? When I, and obviously, he must have called my house. My wife told him where I was. So I get on the phone. He goes, get this band off the bill. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, they're terrible. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, and he... <laughs> You guys will go. I don't know if you'll get a kick out as much as I do, but he goes, it's like pork chops at a bar mitzvah. <laughs> I said, are you I kidding think, me? I think Ron told me this story. That's what he said. It's like pork chops at a bar mitzvah. And I said, Gene, no. You'll get to like him. I'm telling you, Geffen is all in on this band. They'll be great. And I'll admit, I went out, so I flew to the next show. And I'll admit they were not great live. Ron's voice was amazing, but they had never toured before. I mean, they really had never toured before. And you're talking about a band that like probably was used to playing like rehearsal halls. Now they're playing Madison Square, you know, arenas. And, you know, it takes a lot. I mean, Tom Kiefer, I mean, right away, first night, David Lee Roth, he was meant to be in arenas. But, but for whatever reason, Ron was not yet an arena front man. But they let me have my way. And by the end of the tour, they were hanging out in each other's dress rooms. It was like kumbaya, whatever. But it was funny that uh, 
that that happened. So that's one little funny story that I've never told. Before. I mean, I, I, actually, I was that was the I was living in Chicago and I drove to Muskegon, Michigan to see the Hot in the Shade tour there. And that's where Little Caesar was opening. Small little hockey arena. I mean, right. you know, very small. Everything was general admission, standing room only. Well, How do you think they did? I loved it, but I'm a huge Little Caesar fan. Okay. I mean, like you, that that first album. Brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely what a, brilliant. What a voice that guy has. What a voice. Absolute, you know, and the nicest guy and smart and everything else. But, um, you know, Hot in the Shade, it felt like it was a good, you put together a perfect, yeah. for the time, for everything yeah. was perfect. Yeah. For Revenge, you know, and you, it's not, what, three years later, Revenge tour. And I'm just like, hmm trickster and faster pussycat yeah. not not the uh flavor of the month you know, you've anymore. already brought that up three times you keep gonna, gonna keep digging a knife in me on this I yeah mean, well it, it's just you know, i know well, i understand I you know that one and, go michael you just gotta but, let but, that but go. you know yeah. i can even i'll even go back to the crazy nights tour and go why the hell was anthrax opening for kiss i get that they're all big fans of each other right. but it was like Pork you know, the bar yin and yang. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm putting putting this metal band on opening up for Kiss who's singing Crazy Crazy Nights. It's like right. eh, it didn't separately. Well, great. Robert, listen, I'm agreeing with you. It was a shitty package. Let's move on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let let you as you said, you got to go. So let's wrap yeah. up real quick for those who haven't listened to your first first um, appearance here. So Revenge Tour is oh, done. What what led you to saying? Was it you or was it Kiss saying we're parting ways? Well, I'd rather not go too much into it, although I did on the, as you know, I did in the interview a little bit. Um, let's just say we did, we had a disagreement over my compensation and uh, I wasn't willing to take the uh, reduction they were offering. So I just said, I can't do it. I mean, how do I go to Cinderella who are making me a lot of money how do yep. I go to other clients who are making me money? How to say to them, you know, I'm doing this for Kiss, but you know, I'm not going to do it for you. So I just, I just, and I've never done it since. I've never reduced my commission ever in my entire career. And I, it was just, uh, that was it. It was just, it was money. It was a, it was a financial thing. It was not. You can't because they talk. You know, you if you the minute you start cutting your commission for the services yeah. that you do. Yeah, and I was, I look, I'm, 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 I'm upset about it to this day because I really felt that we were set up that another cycle. I really believe, and I said that I wrote when I wrote this letter to Gene, uh, when they were playing Atlantic City, I said that, and I'll say what I said to him I said, I really believe in my heart that Ezrin, myself, and you guys, the next album would have been your Sergeant Pepper. I really, in my heart, I believe. The quality of the song, and I heard some songs, and the quality of the songwriting from especially him, but also Paul, but another record with Bob Ezrin, with me, with my creative mojo, I really believe it would have been there, Sergeant Pepper. And uh, it breaks my heart. I mean, I'm heartbroken to this day because I love the band. And look, I've been to, I've seen them a couple times. I went to a Kiss convention, and they were very nice to me. I, uh, I went to the uh, Psycho Circus tour, uh, they were very nice. I managed a band from England called The Treatment, and they graciously put them as the opening act on the Kiss Motley Crew. Gave us 60 shows opening for Kiss and Motley Crew on that tour a few years ago. Um, they invited me to the Atlantic City show, but they told me they couldn't see me. Um, you know, they've been, they've been, you know, again, and even, even at two weeks ago, uh, well, when I wrote back saying, I'm sorry, you know, if I can't see, I'm not going to come. And he goes, he ended up by saying, Paul and I think very fondly of you. So, you know, having said that, Gene spelled my name wrong in his book, which upset me. Uh, and Paul didn't even mention me in his book. And if I do see him, he and I are going to have a heart to heart about that because I am very hurt that, you know, because I know what I did for him outside of Kiss, some other things about making him a publishing deal for non-Kiss material, whatever. So, you know, there's a hurt side of me, but life goes on and I've Luckily, I've still been breaking bands through the 2000s, so it is what it is. But do I feel, you know, upset by the fact? And listen, I didn't want to manage the makeup. They did, you know, again, I, I don't know if I said this, but they called me about managing the makeup band. I was going to ask I you. Honest, I, wasn't, I wasn't enthused about it. And 
it probably came across on the phone that I wasn't enthused. I said to them, oh, you could charge a thousand bucks a ticket. But that's not the kiss I wanted to manage. I want to manage the kiss with Bruce Kulick writing great guitar riffs, Paul Stanley, Gene Simmons, and an Eric Singer. That's the kiss I wanted to manage. So when they came to me and said about the makeup band, I think my interview was, I was very short. I said, guys, you know what I do. I, again, you either want me or you don't want me. I mean, you know what I do. And look, you're going to do, you're going to charge what you want to charge, et cetera, et cetera. Fine. But you know what I do. I'm not going to audition. And they went with Doc McGee. And I think it's, I wasn't overly enthused and maybe that came through, but again, and look, I could have made a lot of, I'm sure Doc has made a lot of money over these last 15 years of the never ending tour. But as the creative manager, I am, that's not the kiss I wanted to manage. I wanted to manage the kiss that did the revenge record. That's the kiss I wanted to manage. And that was gone. So. Do you, you feel Larry, I mean, you, Again, you did an incredible album, one of the best albums that Kiss has ever released, Revenge. Two amazing tours. Do you feel like you're overshadowed by and their the first time? And let's not forget their first top 10 single in 15 years. Well, yes. Yes. I mean, you accomplished a lot with them. Do you feel like you're overshadowed by the Billicoin Doc McGee managers that 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 the fan, especially from the fan standpoint, fans go, Kiss's managers, Billicoin, Doc McGee. Oh, hold on. What about Larry Mazur? He was incredible. He was very important to them. Well, that... thankfully, thankfully, Bruce Kulick gives me when he does interviews, he gives me tons of credit. Um, Bill of Coin, no. Bill of Coin created this. Bill of Coin deserves every ounce of credibility he gets. I, I personally would not. I mean, I was not. I mean, Bill of Coin invested his own money in the band. He did. I mean, he put it on his credit cards to do the first couple of tours. Bill of Coin deserves every ounce of credibility and thanks he gets for creating what became kiss so i stand in the shadow bill of coin doc different story i mean i like doc we've known each other a long time cinderella supported bon jovi on the super wet tour you know again i went to him about and gene and paul about treatment being on the tour he gave it to me if i see him nice but uh, yeah i mean do, do i feel that i deserve on the creative if you put kiss as a creative entity do i feel that I accomplished more creatively with Kiss than Doc did, who basically did the money trade. I mean, you know, yes, but it is what it is. I mean, so. You know, I, I, I kind of feel like when you talk Kiss producers, people only mention Bob Ezrin and Eddie Kramer and Michael James Jackson is always sort of right. left out. And, you know, he was on two incredible Kiss absolutely. albums that were absolutely, absolutely pivotal to Kiss's absolutely. career. So I look, my ego is not that big. I mean, look, the fact that Derek Oliver called me and said, hey, we've never done this before, but we are all fans of your career at Rock Candy. We want to do a seven page feature on you in the new issue of Rock Candy, which ironically is the Kiss cover issue is kind of funny. Um, that's that to me, you know, I was able to show my kids who have been part of my career, obviously, my whole life. And uh, but to be able to show them in writing what people think of me as a manager that that made my day when they when the article came yesterday to show them what I've done. But uh, listen, I live a, I live in, in in South Jersey. I've never been tempted to move to LA or New York. I've broken a lot of bands. I have a lot of great memories. I'm proud of what I've done. And you know, nobody can take away the 30 million plaque that's in my living room of Kiss. That only five in the world. Me, well, six. Me, Mercury Records, and the four guys in the band and. They'll never take that away. I mean, and, uh, you know, so, you know, I'm proud of what I've accomplished. I'm proud of what I've done for every client I've done. I think even the ones that weren't successful, I think they had an impact from what I brought to the table. And, uh, you know, so do you, no regrets, do you, but, you know, but part, again, but again, out of, out of everyone, they were the most fun to manage. And I do miss it. I mean, I literally laughed every single day for five years until the end i mean laugh they were we would have meetings with me and the two of them that literally i'd be on the floor laughing just watching the two of them i mean it's just i can't describe it but it's 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 the greatest comedy show of all time if you sit with the two of them and have a meeting it's just hilarious how they interact with each other in meetings i mean it's just it's I've, I've i've been fortunate to see that a couple times and it's, you're right it's, 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 it's i loved it it's magical. I miss, I miss it. I loved 
I love because again, as a manager, especially a creative manager, my biggest frustration today, and again, this is a, we'll, I'll gladly do another show with you about the music business, but yeah, we'd love you know, that. It, it, you know, my biggest frustration today is people have forgotten that this business was built on a star front man, a guitar hero, and a great live show. And I loved every meeting with them. I loved the meetings with Cinderella for the Long Cold Winter record. I love some of the other, even Lamb of God. We've done, we did some great shows with Lamb of God. But I mean, it kills me when I go to concerts now and it's just, who cares? I mean, it's just. There's no rock stars look, anymore. Poor guys look at their shoes. Who cares? I mean, yeah. a couple of bands, I mean, Godsmack have tried to put together a good live show with their dueling drummer thing that they do. And I went to see Shine Down last year and they put together a decent show with Pyro. But. I mean, I'll never forget when I went to see Nickelback the first time when they broke and they did their first big tour <laughs> and they're playing a battle, all of a sudden bombs are going off. And it's like, I'm sitting there going, this is obviously a band who said to themselves, if we ever became famous, we're going to put on the greatest kiss show there ever was. But it's like they're playing ballads, all of a sudden pyro's <laughs> going off. And I'm sitting there going, what? I mean, it's just pyro for pyro's sake, you know, and it's like. And it cracks me up. Even Shine Down, it was like every song had flames. I this and yep. You know, again, I love, I'll give you, and I, you guys will probably say yes to this also. One of the, the highlights for me in the Hot in the Shade tour was I Was Made for Loving You. Because A, it's a song that I said, you guys have got to start playing again. If you remember, there was a part in the song where the disco breakdown happens. Mm -hmm. where we had these jets that went off, these sparklers <laughs> that went off during that drum beats right down the whole length of the stage and a big explosion at the end. And that to me was like one of the high, I looked forward to that every night was I was made for loving you and how we had these synchronized lights in that show. And again, that's what I miss about the music business today is that sitting down and just coming up with like, what can we do that's like spectacular, you know? And it's like, that's gone. It's there with the pop acts. A lot of pop acts are doing it, but in the rock world, it's pretty much gone. And that's sad, but you know. Well, Larry, I know you. I know you've got to. Uh, you've got to run. This is fascinating. Um, always love talking to you. And yes. yes, we've got to have you come back and just do a Anytime. talk on the the music Anytime. business itself. Yeah. Um, and you know, as a Kiss fan, thank you for revenge. Thank you. I mean, well, I mean yeah, that, I, that, I, that, that I, mean, tour. I take I take what you're saying in spirit. I didn't write the song, so you know, thank them for revenge. Thank me for the one thing I will say I'm 100% I will take credit for is getting Gene Simmons back in Kiss. And that well, I that, will that, that was everything. That, thank you. that was everything. That was so important as a Kiss fan to sit here and go, our demon is back. The yeah. band looks amazing. Everything's leather. in perfection. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I think we, we mentioned this on the round table for Rock Candy. It was like, Creatures of the Night, when as a KISS fan, we heard Creatures of the Night for the first time after Elder, Unmasked, Dynasty were like, Yes, they're back. And the well, tour kicked you in the and, ass as well. And we put out and we put out live a live three. We did put out I Love It Loud as quote the single from a live three, because again, I just want to keep drilling Gene Simmons, Gene Simmons, Gene Simmons, you know. So and you know, Larry, you. for that for the Alive Three, you also did that other um, it was like a secret promo party where you get to go to uh like the radio stations held this party and it was like a secret location and only so many people got to go because that's what i did in pittsburgh it was really really cool and you got the band was there and um it was it was like, like one of those autographing events that you yes. did confidential yeah, yeah you it did was that for a really cool three. yeah yep yep yep, yep. and again without a sec without a without a second of pushback. And listen, I've had baby bands that have pushed back on doing stuff that I thought was important for their career. And they push back when they've sold no records. And here's Kiss who literally, guys, I want to do a club tour. No problem. Guys, I want to do autograph sessions. No problem. I mean, it was like literally in five years, other than the, the domino thing, which again, I understand the mentality of it. But as far as creative things that I brought to the band, Never did they say no in five years. Never once. Well, you know, and the thing that was really cool about that autograph session was that it wasn't just like, okay, you show up here and it's an autograph session. It was like, you know, you'll be notified of the secret location the day of the, the Where day we of doing the signing. I don't remember. Where are we doing in Pittsburgh? Uh, uh, the graffiti. Okay. It was this little club, you know, in the city, but it was like, you know, no one knew where it was going to be. And you were going to get a call that day to tell you where you had to be at a certain time. I mean, it was like so mysterious, you know, so it wasn't just a signing. 
it was right. this whole like it was this whole thing about it that made it so mysterious was, was and, it, wasn't there also i think at least in chicago if you bought kiss alive three you got a laminate uh, not a laminate but a stick on pass that I got remember. you admitted to the to one of those secret parties yeah I don't yeah but I some of them didn't have it in there though I don't remember. Some of them didn't have it because I bought the Alive 3 and I didn't get a patch, but I was I worked at the radio station there. Right. But I just remember how neat it was. And I had a call like once I found out who where it was, I would call all these certain people and tell them where it was. It was really, really cool. That's when the record really releases were fun. Yeah, they were events. Well, it's a um, shame. Uh, it's a shame you guys weren't around for the uh, the Cinderella Heartbreak Station because that is the greatest party in the history of the music business. So. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, and what's funny is, what's funny is, I mean, I'll tell you real quick. I mean, it was a quarter million dollars. We rented, you know, Heartbreak Station was this real down home concept record. We did most of it in Bogalusa, Louisiana. And so we rented, and I can't believe I got Mercury to agree to spend a quarter million dollars, but they did. We rented a, the Natchez, which is a famous riverboat on the Mississippi. Yep. We flew in journalists, radio people, record all the mercury office from around the world like 300 people flew in put them in new orleans for three days and then we did a uh we went on the mississippi for a three-hour cruise there was a blues band tom played we had fran o'brien's do the bar we had catered cajun food and then it stopped after three hours it stopped in the middle of the mississippi and we had towed out a barge and did a 20-minute fireworks display where the last one was blowing the cinderella logo in the air and fireworks Oh, cool. And it wow. blew people's minds. The next week, the next week, Queen had just signed the Hollywood Records. And they did it. They had a party on the Queen Mary in Long Beach to introduce the signing of Queen. And they pulled out all the whistles. This was Hollywood Records. They pulled out all the whistles, whatever. And about all the same journalists and radio people, and obviously not Mercury Records person, but all the same radio people and journalists. And I got a call Monday morning from the president of Hollywood Records going, you killed us. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, every person on our cruise came up and said, this was great, but not as good as that Cinderella party last week. <laughs> good for you. Good so, for you. Nice. Those days good are gone. You, to get a label to spend $25 launching a record yeah. nowadays is a miracle, let alone a quarter of a million dollars. But Yep, 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 yep. So. That's a, as you said, that's a whole nother discussion, which yeah. we will have. Okay. Larry, Thank you so much. This Thank was you, an amazing discussion. Thank you for your time. No problem. Billy Rose guys. said to Talk say soon. hi. Yes, All right, thank thanks. you. All right, guys. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Uh, what, what can you say? Larry is filled with so many great stories and memories and the ability to recount what happened. And not just with Kiss, the Buck Cherry, the Cinderella. I mean, this is a guy who's touched so many bands and by the way i was i was true to my word i almost didn't say anything because i wanted to listen to him talk that's how i yes. felt too i was i just i was just i just loved hearing him speak he was he was so um he's an excellent storyteller yes you know? but mark was feeling sick because he wasn't saying anything oh i'm sure some 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 of our listeners are gonna go oh mark you so rude of you you, you weren't didn't interested say a word you weren't interested at all. <laughs> Just the opposite. I didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> no. that's the, I love I love hearing like from the management side, like the music business side, because that's such my my passion. I love hearing that. I was so like, ooh, yeah, I was giddy. I mean, I mean Larry <laughs> managed the band. Larry was there, as he said, he was there during the the Eric Carr when Eric Carr was was passing. He was there. He dealt with it. He was in the meetings. He was there when he took over Hot in the Shade after the album was done. I mean, you know, he, he got the phone call from Gene saying, nope, got to give Paul the second single. I, I tell you, one of, his, one of his accomplishments doesn't go, I guess, should be noticed more. Now, let's be honest here. I mean, in the middle of the grunge era, he was able to get two gold albums out of them. Mm, that's right. what I was going to say too. I mean, he was he was managing Kiss it like <laughs> like a that that can that cannot be easy. I mean, mm -hmm. like you said though too. One of the you know kudos to Gene and Paul. A lot of bands. I, well, I don't know a lot of bands. I don't know if that's a true statement, but let's let's just say there if there would have been some acts. I think seventies acts that 
wouldn't have done the legwork. Gene and Paul did the, the club tour. Gene and Paul did the, the, the signings, which I know are very taxing on them. But, and, you know, like you said, he, he did, the, the, he convinced the band to do those without a, you know, without any pushback, you know, um, that was pretty huge, you know, um, for them to do. I mean, especially ego wise and, and, uh, for as much as I, I know this may hurt the psyche of Gene and Paul and maybe even some other KISS fans, you you don't think it bothered them to see how MTV was all over Aerosmith? Had to have bothered. Well, and that's what I was kind of saying last week when we were talking about that. That had to be frustrating because I thought collectively when I listened to these records in the 80s, they had better songs than those Aerosmith songs at least for me, because I still listen to those to this day, whereas the Aerosmith stuff, like to your point, Mark, from last week, good Lord, Janie's got a gun. Well, oh, geez, I hope she shoots the rest of them because I don't want to listen to this song again. Because it, I agree with I, you. I agree yeah, with you. Yeah, that's not my Aerosmith. Yeah, they lost, uh, you know, they became a Holly Knight cover band. I mean, that's mm-hmm. all they were doing, you know. But anyways, uh, but also too, you know, um, don't think Paul Stanley didn't have his eye on that too. What was that piece of shit song uh, on the Detroit Rock City movie? Oh, God. oh, nothing can keep me from you. Yeah, nothing can Ugh. keep me from ever wanting to hear that song ever again. It's fucking horrible. No, no, nothing more than an absolute blatant attempt to get a number one single for uh, Paul Stanley. It is bad That's enough just. To, yeah, we know the list now just to get Mark to show up for a Pretty Boy Floyd concert. Okay. I can't. You know even what? Imagine. Enough about the Pretty Boy Floyd for God's sakes. Okay, enough. You know, I love Pretty Boy Floyd. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I know you do. It's just funny fans. that we actually got Mark to admit to what it will take to get him into a Pretty Boy Floyd. What was it? I don't even know. What, what did you say? Mark? Hold on. It was all the seafood I could eat. A separate right. room where I don't have to see or hear them. A soundproof. Soundproof. A a soundproof. soundproof. That would, yes, yes. Room. So it I would can be, be in the same were... building, but I don't want to ever see them or hear them. All the seafood I can eat, and I believe strippers were involved too. If, if uh... no, it wasn't strippers; it was a porn. It was Chippendales. Oh, it was a porn star. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you give me so all those anyway, things. We we know one of one of the one of the guys in Pretty Boy Floyd listens to Three Sides. So listen, you want Mark Chikini at a show, seafood buffet, a porn star, and put him in the back room and close the door. <laughs> but you can say Mark Chikini was at your concert. Well, hold on. If, if I like the band, you don't have to give me any of those things. I'll go if the music's good. So, really, you turn down a free crab buffet if, if it's just good music? Yeah, I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, all right. So, so I. I hope you guys all agree. We've got to get Larry to come back and do a non-kiss yes. show. I didn't ask him about union. About the industry. I didn't even ask him about union. You know what? I didn't want to sidetrack even more, Lisa, because I, I already sidetracked enough with Buck Cherry. I wanted to say to him, well, what heck? Because that first union That's, record is dying on I know. I wanted to say the same thing. It's like, listen, they had amazing albums. Like, what happened? What happened? What happened? Because my God, those albums were phenomenal. Uh, I'm phenomenal. not, you know, I, I won't say the uh, Blue Room. The first uh, record. No, the died. first one was good. I think the well, I like the Blue Room too. I mean, I don't have a problem with it. But that, but you have to admit, Old Man Wise, the first title yeah. when you put on that oh. first, boom. Phenomenal. That but anyway, I just I wanted record. to know. I would have loved to know what his thoughts were on that, you know, and and what was what why? I mean, the, the my question is why just. Oh, and I, I want to be clear to you. I don't dislike the Blue Room. I just don't think it's as good as no, the first. No one said you. No one said you disliked just, it, Mark. Just making sure. You know it's good. That? Don't put words in our work. mouths. Do it's not say that. Good Mark is sensitive today. No, no I'm he's just making hangry. Sure. Hangry. Yeah, that I am. We've got. Fact, we've we got do have ten minutes to lasagna. So notice how when he loses audio, we all think he's taking someone's order, talking to Gene. There Simmons. you go. Can when, you hear me? When, yeah, yes. and when there Mark is muted, we're like, okay, he's ordering something from Adam and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, all right. So, um, yes, we're going to have Larry back, and we're going to talk just about the music <clears throat> business. Homework questions, uh, you know, revenge. 
I don't know what what kind of question we could ask. There's nothing bad about it. I mean, we got Gene Simmons back. It was a great tour, great set list. The album what rock. What did you learn? What did you learn from Larry? Did you that learn you didn't anything? Know? Yeah, I think I'm with him. I think if Domino was the second single, it would have done even better. Mm-hmm. People to this day still love that song. Oh yeah. When you're at White Table, when we were on the Kiss Cruise, that that one's always requested. I don't want to, not so much. And don't get me wrong; I think it's a good song too. It's a good song, but not. It doesn't have it's, that good it, punch to it like Domino does. Correct. And, and, and mm-hmm. I tell you what, even even I remember back back in the day, Liz really liked that song, Domino. I mean, it's just a cool song. You know what I mean? I think I was never love. a big unholy person, though. I, I think it grew on me because when you first oh, no, hear it, perfect. I know, but when I'm used to like Kiss, like that, when I first heard it, I was like, whoa, whoa, wait. What? It was very dark. You know what I mean? I mean, I guess it was appropriate for the time, but it kind of like it was like right in my face. Like, oh, I, this is since this was pre-internet, my phone. I think I was on the phone till five in the morning talking to people all over the U.S. when that debuted, because we all were like, this is kiss again. It's heavy. It's dark. It's this. Matter of fact, I remember very I remember verbatim. I remember one of the first things I said after I heard Unholy is this could be a makeup song, meaning that song would have fit mm-hmm. great on Creatures. Mm-hmm. And which it's funny because, you know, they did end up doing it on the uh, Rock the Nation tour. Um, so that's what I mean. It, it really did echo back to Gene. I mean, Gene was back on uh, on that and everything about the video was just cool. And the song, it sounded so good and. You know, I never really thought about him, how he was saying about, you know, the, the whole the whole premise was Gene being back. You know, now that I take a step back and look at that, yeah, that's it's 100 percent. I guess I never realized it, but he I mean, wow, that was really cool. I mean, that that to, to some extent, that's why everything about Revenge was so great, because we got Gene back got Gene and back. not just back, but fully committed and entrenched in doing what he needs to do it wasn't just appearing it was gene simmons writing great songs not like the crap he wrote during i'm going to tell you too his bass tone was back he was doing slides he, in a word yep. he gave a shit he gave a shit all of a sudden and that yeah i think to some extent lisa what you were saying about how unholy kind of was kind of a bit of a surprise that's why i mean remember we're coming off of hot in the shade which was a blah coming off of crazy nights, which was all party and have a good time. And all of a sudden you're hit with this surprise of Gene Simmons and unholy is the first single and a dark, heavy video. And you're like, yeah, that video was incredible. I mean, it he wasn't like not this. that it was bad. I mean, it was awesome. As kiss fans, we weren't expecting that. No, no, that's what I mean. It wasn't like it was bad. It was just, it, wait, it, what? It, it, uh-huh. like, and that's what I wanted. That's yeah. what I wanted. I didn't want this stupid fucking turn on the night bullshit. Well, I didn't want that. For, I didn't. I didn't like the the crap oh, that bitter. they did on. For, for, that? for you know, that's bitter. For 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 those of you who were fans when Revenge came out and remember that feeling, that's exactly the same feeling we had when Creatures of the Night hit. Yes. Exactly. We weren't expecting Creatures of the Night. Not at all. We were like, okay, Dynasty, Unmasked, Elder, where the hell are we going here? Kenny G, is that when you drop the needle on creatures? It was just like, what the fuck? They're back. I felt like the kid in Animal House. Thank you, God. (laughs) And, And Revenge was the same way. Musically, the album was like, they're back. But when that that video hit for Unholy, you're like, wow this this is kiss where have you been where have you been for 10 years yep so hallmark just talk about revenge what did you learn uh what do you want us to ask larry next time he comes back um you know you know and thank you larry for for talking about eric carr i mean i think that was you know we didn't we didn't plan that that was Larry bringing that up on his own. I'm glad he did. Um, he was there. That's why we don't talk about it. We weren't there. Uh, okay. So you know where to go to leave your homework, anywhere you find us online, leave a comment. And uh, if you're uh, 
watching or listening on YouTube, please subscribe, follow us on Spotify, subscribe on iTunes. And uh, we appreciate everything, all the comments, all the following, everything, everybody who hits that play button. It means a lot to us. Um, that's it. We'll see everybody next week. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.